Thank you for checking out Lakehead International's videos. You're about to watch one of our Lakehead International live webinars, a fun and informative way to learn more about Lakehead while also meeting faculty, staff, and current students. If you have any questions throughout today's video, please comment below. Otherwise, let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to another Lakehead International Live. My name is Jordan Ball. I'll be your host today. In a moment here, I'll introduce our special guest for our International Lecture Showcase series where we'll be chatting about climate change, the biosphere, and Ontario's north. But first and foremost, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us. Whether it's your morning, your afternoon, your evening, um, we certainly appreciate your time. We're excited for you to be getting a sample lecture from um, a distinguished professor here at Lakehead University. And we also hope you came prepared to ask plenty of questions, whether the questions are related to today's sample lecture, or of course, if they're anything to do with Lakehead, we also have Martin behind the scenes who will be helping to answer those questions. On that note though, it's time to introduce our special guest and I'll pass it over to Dr. Basilico to introduce himself. Great. Thank you so much, Jordan. And uh, hello, everyone. It's a uh, it's morning here in Thunder Bay, Ontario and feeling very spring like, but I'm uh, really honored to be able to do this. So I'm a um, relatively new faculty member in, um, in the Faculty of Natural Resources Management. And uh, prior to this, I came from a, I was a Canada Research Chair at Laurentian University in Northeastern Ontario and um, a professor of uh, forest processes at, uh, at the University of Toronto prior to that. So it's been a very exciting new move to me for Lakehead and I've enjoyed it quite a bit so far and I hope many of you will come and, uh, and also get a lot out of it like I have. So uh, we'll be chatting with you in a second. Thank you again for for uh, for having me do this, and uh, Jordan, and and welcome to everyone uh, in the audience. Thanks for thanks for attending, as well too. So I'm going to give a quick a quick overview of of the state of climate change right now, of human induced climate change. Um, talk about how um, the the natural world, so the biosphere, um, plants and soils on land, uh, to some extent the oceans, interact with with climate, both being affected by climate change, but also because they take up and release large amounts of greenhouse gases themselves, um, how they, they play a role in feedbacks with our changing climate. And then focus in on Ontario's north and particularly present a bit about, um, about forest management and forestry uh, um, in, in Ontario. So this is the composition of our atmosphere. It's made up mainly of it relatively inert nitrogen, of course, molecular oxygen. But there's some trace gases in relatively small, small amounts that without which the earth would be much cooler. So if we take away mainly the carbon dioxide, but also the methane and nitrous oxide, the temperature, the global average earth temperature would drop by over 30 degrees Celsius. And of course, this would make life as we know it on earth um, uh, probably non-existent, if not very, very different. So these are, of course, the long-lived greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, and they are very good at letting uh, shortwave light and UV energy pass through, uh, but then trapping longwave heat, uh, heat energy um, in the atmosphere um, and at the Earth's surface. So this is the concentration of these three greenhouse gases over the past 2000 uh, and so years. So of carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide. Scientists have been measuring these uh, beginning in about 1950, the late 50s. Uh, and then there's large global networks and even satellites can measure these in different layers of the atmosphere. But they were able to reconstruct the past concentrations of what the atmosphere looked like by analyzing trapped bubbles of air in continuous um, um, ice sheets like the Greenland ice sheet and, and, and figure out what the past record of, of these greenhouse gases have been. And you see for, they were quite stable until about the mid to late 1800s when of course we started mining fossil fuels and uh, population growth uh, really began to increase a great deal. A lot of land was converted from forest to agriculture and the concentrations of these have gone up uh, quite a bit. Uh, we've we're at a record. It hit 414 parts per million uh, CO2 in uh, in 2021. Um, and what is the what effect has this had? So this figure is showing temperature deviations um, from a from a relatively recent average. So the zero line here represents the average uh, Earth surface air temperature from um, 1950 to 1980. Um, so you can see those years are kind of about zero. And a value above this means it's it's warmer than that, and a value below 
means it's it's colder. Um, and one very you know clear thing is that all of these different agencies that are tracking sort of global Earth surface temperatures are they're 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 tightly aligned, right? This is a this is a thing we're measuring very very accurately and very precisely. Um, you can see a couple things. First of all, uh, the Earth's air surface temperature has gone up very dramatically in the last uh, uh, 50 years or, or 45 or 50 years. Um, we haven't had a colder than average uh, year since 1976 globally. Um, and, and this isn't the long-term average, this is the average from 1950 to 1980. So already experiencing some effects of, of global warming. Um, and so, you know, this might not seem like a lot. It's about, it's, a, it's not quite 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial background level, but that translates into something like three or four extra watts of energy per meter squared over the entire Earth's surface. Some other important things to consider too are that um, this isn't evenly distributed. There's some parts of the Earth that are not warming very much. And then there's others, particularly um, in far northern regions in, in Canada and, uh, and other uh, high altitude, or sorry, high latitude locations that are warming disproportionately. Um, and also it's not just the temperature that's being affected. Of course, the, the changing uh, atmosphere affects, um, affects precipitation patterns that can even affect ocean circulation patterns. And uh, this is a little alarming, but just five days ago, scientists made a, a pretty serious prediction that there's a two third chance that this summer we will break the 1.5 degree increase in global average uh, temperature for the first time. Now this was set as the, in the 2015 Paris Accord uh, to combat you know, kind of to bring countries together to combat global warming. This was set as the, you know, if we keep it under 1.5 degrees, things will be generally okay. So we're already we're already going to pass this key warming threshold for the first time uh, much earlier than an anticipated. So climate change, um, of, of course, it in, includes warming and increased average air surface temperature, but the changing atmosphere also changes precipitation. You know, warmer atmospheres hold different amounts of, of vapor and, and water. Um, and you see big changes in extreme weather and not only, uh, not only um, extreme storms, you know, high intensity precipitation and wind, but also extreme drought. And for example, we see, you know, some of the most severe wildfires in forests of Alberta going on right now um, that, are, that are linked to this. And also altered water levels, not only in lakes, um, uh, but, but also in, in aquifers and soil water that are so important for, for ecosystems and for people. So this climate change affects how ecosystems function. The, the environmental conditions in, influence how, how trees and plants grow. It increases how much productivity they are and how productive they are. It, increase, it, it affects how the microbes, the microorganisms that break down you know, dead plant litters um, and recycle nutrients. It, it affects their rates of activity. It affects um, you know, how ecosystems respond to disturbance in a sort of, they're, they're, they're forced in these non-natural environmental conditions where the, where the organisms evolved, they're pushed out of those thresholds. And we see, you know, changing resiliency to even natural stressors like droughts and forest fire that are part of the natural systems uh, when we're pushing too far with climate warming and droughts. Um, even invasive species. So a good case of this in Canada is, um, uh, a, a, a natural or native pest, uh, the mountain pine beetle that, that interacts with mainly lodgepole pine in Western Canada. Um, from about the mid 2000s to 2015, um, the fact that British Columbia had not had a cold winter in about 30 years meant that the populations of these beetles were increasing astronomically. And um, by that time, by about the, the um, mid 2010s, um, this natural pest had killed an area of lodgepole pine um, about the size of Portugal, so twice the size of the province of New Brunswick in in uh, in Canada, um, and of course that you know standing dead wood now increases the risk of fire and it changes how we manage our forests and things. Um, so big impacts we're already seeing of climate change on how our 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 ecosystems function, but it's also a two way street. Um, ecosystems and how ecosystems change. Uh, affect the global climate system. And how do they do that? Well, mainly because our biosphere, or, you know, our global ecosystems, they take up and release a lot of greenhouse gases. So as trees grow in this picture, they take up carbon dioxide, so carbon from the atmosphere that's sustaining that global greenhouse effect. Um, and they breathe it out as they respire. The mainly microorganisms, the decomposers, break down uh, dead plant litters and you know dead tree roots and leaves. 
And they release carbon dioxide and under different conditions, they can also release methane and nitrous oxide, these other greenhouse gases. And there's something like 20 times more carbon dioxide that goes into and out of the global biosphere each year than we emit as fossil fuel carbon. Um, so there's this big natural breathing of the biosphere that's going on as well as we're increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide from, from fossil fuel burning. And this means that ecosystems and globally, global forests and global oceans, for example, have key feedback roles to play in what our future climate system looks like. I want to just take a second here. This is showing some of, you know, uh, two, two uh, uh, forest floors and then some soil. And uh, my research group and kind of my expertise is really on how microorganisms convert you know what what is initially biomass living you know living trees and other plants uh, after the parts die the leaves fall or the or the tree dies and the wood you know topples over how microbes convert that into this this soil organic matter the dark the dark topsoil here you see in the soil profile or what's being held in this person's hand here um, and that's really kind of uh, the the nitty-gritty of what what my expertise and what our group does is studies how microbes convert plants into this soil organic matter and as they finally break it down how greenhouse gases are released back to the atmosphere and how nutrients are cycled with that and that supports the next generation of of plant and tree growth okay got a polling question here and i think i can launch it uh um oh awesome we got 42 participants the earth's average temperature is predicted to rise above 1.5 degrees c from pre-industrial levels this year this is really the, the point in the presentation where we see if the audience who's been with us since the beginning, granted, <laughs> has been paying attention because I know that you did discuss this in a, a brief article there. <laughs> it was the BBC News article, was it? A yes or no? Okay, looks like we got uh, 32 of 43. We'll just give another few seconds if you want to participate. And we'll stop in three, two, one. Share results. All right. So 94% of you got it right. It is true. Now there's a little caveat with that. It's supposed to be linked to an El Nino temperature surge. So El Nino is sort of this periodic uh, change in ocean circulation. Um, so it might fall back down below that again, but we're getting very, very close. Okay. Excellent work. Okay. So this is a, this is a, a map of Ontario and it's showing kind of the different broadest eco regions of Ontario. I'll say Ontario is the size of, of, of France and Spain combined. So this is a massive, massive province, you know, with just a tiny fraction of the populations of those countries. Um, if we look at um, the, the far north and there is permafrost in the far north of Ontario along the Hudson and James Bay, um, we see the Hudson Bay lowlands. This is one of the largest wetlands on earth, earth arguably this, the third largest wetland by area on earth. It's this massive com complex of peatlands, these wetlands that uh, accumulate huge amounts of dead plant material that represents stored organic carbon. This is just the surface 50 centimeters of one of these peatlands, but these can be meters and meters deep. These wetlands are really important. They're experiencing rapid climate change. Um, I, I'm personally very, very interested in how these wetlands function and respond to changes. It's not what I'm going to talk about for the rest of today, though. I'm going to focus mainly on these two zones in the middle, the Boreal Forest and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Forest. And you see there's these two yellow squiggly lines. These kind of represent the upper and lower limits of where large scale forest management occurs in Ontario. It's, it's really interesting to note that 90 percent of that area is publicly owned. So managed by the province, it's called provincial crown uh, crown land. Um, and, uh, and, and that's a, that's a key theme in Canada. Quebec has about the same percentage of its, of its forest land that's publicly managed and owned. British Columbia is 94%. So it's a, it's an interesting situation in Canada. Um, so there's the boreal forest and what's called the Great Lakes St. Lawrence forest, which is sort of a hardwood broadleaf, uh, mixed deciduous forest. And when these forests are managed, they're managed um, in different ways. You can manage a forest to create an even age system. You know, clear cutting is the most common way. You cut down a whole big swath of trees all at the same time. You plant, you do some site prep, and then the next generation of trees grows up all the same age. Um, and or versus uneven aged systems where you go in and, and use um, selection methods where you, you take out, uh, for example, um, uh, trees of all different ages at once. And that leaves behind an uneven age stand, some very young trees and some very large mature trees. And there's different reasons why this is done. Um, in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence forest where, forest, where you see things like sugar maple and yellow birch and 
uh, eastern hemlock as dominant tree species. Um, one of the key themes in, in, in sustainable forest management in Ontario and in Canada is try to emulate natural disturbance. So think about how would these forests naturally um, be disturbed, um, you know, by mainly by climate forces, but also by uh, pests. Um, and let's try to emulate that and take the trees out before they die naturally. So in these in these kind of you know mixed hardwood dominated forests in central Ontario, the dominant disturbance might be, for example, small bursts of wind, or because they're quite biodiverse forests, a pest might affect one tree species, but there's lots of other dominant tree species. So you end up with patches of tree mortality. So here's single tree selection is a very common one where about 30% of the mature trees are, are logged about every 20 years. So there's a very frequent disturbance, but it's not removing all the trees. The other thing is that the dominant trees in this in this forest, things like sugar maple, they grow under low light conditions initially. So they can live in the understory where there's little light, maybe hundreds or thousands of little maple seedlings and saplings just waiting for a, a gap to open in the in the tall canopy and then zoom up and take that light resource. Um, so it's it's a way of managing for um, for trees that are shade tolerant. Now in the vast boreal um, uh, ecoregions of Ontario, um, the trees are, there, there are deciduous broadleaf trees, but there's also a dominance of things like spruce, uh, you know, black spruce and, uh, and pine, jack pine and red pine and uh, balsam fir. And these are trees that need to grow initially under high light conditions. They're also forests that typically would experience relatively large scale disturbances in the, in, in the form of wildfire or some combination of pest outbreak followed by wildfire. So you might be more inclined to have large expanses of trees dying naturally all at once. So this is justification if you're trying to emulate that natural disturbance or kind of simulate that natural disturbance to go in and clear cut, cut down, you know, hectares and hectares of trees all at once and then replant and then they come back, it's the same age. So here the, the harvesting might only occur every, uh, you know, 50 to 100 years. So a, a, a less frequent, but a more intensive, bigger disturbance when it happens. Now, of course, there's lots of, you know, issues around whether we are actually emulating natural disturbance. And those are some of the key questions that researchers at Natural Resources and Lakehead and, and you know, other, other, other places are trying to answer to try to carry out forestry more sustainably. Okay, so we talked about how um, the biosphere affects climate and of course climate change is affecting the biosphere and affecting forests. Here's a map of global forests. It shows you just how important forests are uh, across Canada. So the green areas are major global forest areas. Um, Jude Pan, she came up with a number of 861 gigatons of carbon that are present in forests globally. So about 40% in trees, 44% in soils, and about 16% is the dead stuff lying on the ground. I did the quick calculation last night as I was working through my slides. This year, we're at exactly 861 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. That's the carbon dioxide that drives the majority of the greenhouse effect in recent climate change. So there's exactly as much carbon stored in global forests as there is carbon in the atmosphere. So as we change our forests by, you know, through climate change or through management, there's a big potential for that forest carbon to either end up in the atmosphere or for potentially for more of the atmospheric carbon to be taken up by the trees as they grow. Um, Canada has a, a new initiative, the Two Billion Tree Initiative, trying to put trees uh, where there haven't been trees for a while or where there haven't been trees in a long time. This is a picture of uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau um, with very famous uh, primate scientist Jane Goodall in Sudbury, Ontario. Sudbury is one of the largest industrial impact zones in the country. It's one of globally the largest metal mining and smelting areas. So a big, big legacy of mining and smelter pollution, but also a huge regreening initiative since the companies have cleaned up their acts. And Jane Goodall came to Sudbury to plant the 10 millionth tree in the city proper. And, uh, um, and I used to live and work there and did a fair bit of work on afforestation. So basically trying to restore forests where there haven't been forests for a very long period of time in this severely polluted landscape. And you can see with the right, with the right um, land reclamation effort, putting lime and fertilizer down in the soils and then planting grasses and then going back and planting trees. These are two, two adjacent areas. Um, one has not had any land reclamation. The other one had red pine trees planted after land reclamation about 30 years 
uh, prior. And you can see actually a very nice forest returning. I took some soil cores. So here's what the soils look like in that barren area versus the relatively young 30 year old forest. And you see there's organic matter forming at the top of that soil core. Um, so there is some important potential to restore forests where they haven't been in a while. A lot of this interest recently, and indeed the two billion tree plan for the country of Canada came from a very famous and I'll dare say infamous paper, the Global Tree Restoration Potential published in 2019 in the journal Science, so a very eminent uh, um, uh, scientific journal with a value that if we were to plant trees everywhere that trees could survive where they aren't presently, we could, um, we could uh, add an extra almost 100 billion hectares of forest land. So, you know, adding another 25% of the global land area that's covered with forest, 205 gigatons of carbon. That's like, you know, uh, almost a quarter of what's in the atmosphere. Think of all the global cooling you could stimulate if you could just do that. The author said this highlights global tree restoration is our most effective climate change solution to date. Well, usually when things sound too easy and too good to be true, they sometimes are. And there were some, some areas that got a lot of criticism in this paper, even in the same year. So other scientists who study global forests and global carbon were reporting that that number is five times too large, or that you would need three times the actual land area to do this that exists on earth. And then lots of other very you know, uh, critical responses to this saying, you, you could be displacing people who rely on converted forest land for, 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 for agriculture and food production. You know? So this is sort of a pie in the sky plan, but the, the, and this is, I just did this, I put into Google Scholar, the Global Tree Restoration Research, and there's hundreds of critiques on this, on this paper. But it was the impetus for planting trees. Uh, and don't get me wrong, there's many, many, many great reasons to plant trees and to convert areas that are not forest back into forest. But we have to be careful because this is not going to be the climate change mitigation solution that can save us from burning fossil fuels, right? Really, the only long-term solution is to stop burning fossil fuels and then slowly let the Earth's biosphere sort of catch back up. Um, so many, many reasons for planting forests, uh, but the potential to store lots and lots of carbon in areas where there aren't forests has been highly criticized. One of the reasons is that forest disturbance is expected. It's natural. You know, the, the disturbance is part of forest ecosystems. Um, this is the, I took this screenshot just this morning as I was practicing my, my lecture. And this is the government of Alberta's wildfire status dashboard. And there've been some of the most intense widespread wildfires in Alberta over the past few weeks. I guess some rain has made things quite a bit better over the weekend, but the hazy picture is downtown Edmonton on the weekend, the capital of Alberta. Here's an active wildfire, 71 active fires, 518 already this year. And I'll tell you in Thunder Bay, where the climate's even a little warmer than lots of parts of Alberta, it still feels like early spring here. So imagine in the, the deep heat of summer. Um, so disturbance is also changing relatively rapidly because of climate change. You're having more prolonged droughts, the atmosphere holding more water and it raining less, um, which, is, which, is, which is making disturbance you know, uh, a bigger part of forest ecosystems. And that means if you're counting on carbon to be stored in trees that are supposed to live for hundreds and hundreds of years and they don't, um, we, we can't rely on that as a way to mitigate uh, climate change. This, this is the map, this is Western Canada and the Western US. And uh, the, the green area shows all of the uh, lodgepole pine forest that was killed by mountain pine beetle by the year 2010. So this was a natural pest that was always sort of, you know, thinning out old lodgepole pine forest, but you know, every decade there would be a really cold winter and it would knock the population back. But by 2010, there had been about 35 years of no cold winters, no extreme cold in the, in the dead of winter that would kill off those beetle larvae. And an area, again, larger than Portugal, um, it by 2010 was standing dead lodgepole pine trees, huge risk for fire, big, big management questions. Are you supposed to go in and remove that dead wood? Is it better to let it burn? Um, so many, many questions. Okay, next polling question, and I will try to launch the right one. Okay, so forestry in Ontario always involves clear cutting. So removing all of the standing trees. Uh, you know, maybe it's easier, it's cheaper, and you always want forests that are the same age and same size. 
Oh, you were listening. Oh, a few of you weren't. <laughs> Seems to be going mainly to the correct answer. So I have a sneaking suspicion that some of our future NRM students are also on today's session. Oh, Maybe they, excellent. They've joined perhaps <laughs> to meet their future professor or, or supervisor. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so. um, but yeah, it's interesting to see sort of, and obviously uh, having these diverse answers, some people feel it's false, some people feel it's true. So whether or not it was a lack of paying attention, perhaps, or if it's your general understanding. Absolutely. Yes. And these are tough questions. You spend, you'll spend, uh, um, you know, many years figuring out the rationale between how forests are grown and 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 harvested in some cases. Okay, I'm going to end the poll in three, two, one, and end it and share the results. Seventy-one percent of you got it right. So the answer is false. Now, the majority of managed forests in Ontario do involve clear cutting because the boreal forests with these light, loving conifers like black spruce and jack pine. Um, that is the major management approach, but other forests, uh, you know, sugar maple forests, even even white pine forests are managed differently with, with either staged clear cutting or with um, selection logging. Good. Okay. And this is the last polling question. So let me share again here. And I, oh, it's not gonna let me relaunch this one, I don't think, oh no. Yes, it will, okay, good. Okay, planting trees that grow and take up carbon from the atmosphere is one of the most effective and safe ways for Canada to combat global warming, true or false? I'll take this opportunity to remind our audience too, if you have any questions, um, about today's presentation, you're more than welcome to pose those. We will have an open Q&A period towards the end. I know we've already received some questions. I have some for myself written down already. I'm curious to know a bit more. Um, but this is your opportunity to uh, start posing questions and getting involved as a future student of Lakehead University. And please uh, feel... Oh, sorry, Jared. No, no, go uh, ahead. Feel free to reach out to me too. I put my email at the beginning and end. I also have a pretty unique last name. So if you just Google it, it comes up pr uh, pretty easily. You'll find my academic webpage. And uh, um, if I can't answer your question, I can put you in touch with you know another professor or another, um, another person in the, the international office or other, other places um, to get you an answer. Okay, gonna end in three, two, one. And so the majority of you said true. Um, and maybe I'm, you know, a little too jaded and skeptical. I think it's, I, th I would say it's probably false. There's many, many good reasons to plant trees because forests are so, you know, um, you know, so commonly and naturally disturbed is a way to take up extra carbon dioxide that we've pumped into the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning. This might not be the safest way to do it. And also there's always worry that, you know, people, you know, hearing from their governments and from scientists that this is a great way to solve the global climate change problem, they might be less interested in, you know, converting to a more sustainable energy system. Um, but it's a controversial question again. And I think there certainly is some potential. I, I don't think there's as much potential as we'd like. That said, still many other reasons to, to, to you know, restore forests and plant trees that you'll learn about if you, if you come to natural resources at, uh, at Lakehead. Um, okay, so now, Let's assume that Canada's and global forests um, um, are at least large stocks of carbon, meaning there's there's you know almost as, there's as much carbon sitting in forests globally as in the atmosphere. Maybe we can't put too much more in that. They can't be these perpetual global carbon sinks, but let's just say that they're carbon stocks. And let's say under the best forest management, the type of forestry that you forest management you can learn if you come to uh, come to Lakehead, um, then you can keep them as carbon neutral, meaning that yes, you cut down trees, carbon's released, but those forests are restored. Uh, one big potential for the forestry sector um, to help mitigate climate change is through the use of and production of bioenergy. So instead of, you know, um, instead of allowing wood to just decompose, uh, or instead of just making it into wood and paper products, that some fraction of that gets turned into um, more renewable energy. Now, there's already a big precedent for that. 
the the craft recovery boiler was a, a invented by a Canadian in the 1930s, and it was a way of burning all of the parts of wood chips that are not turned into paper. So paper, pulp and paper is pretty much pure cellulose, but there's lots of other things in trees. There's lignin and there's some other chemicals. In the recovery process, these are burned, converted into bioenergy, and then the digest chemicals are, are regenerated. Um, and I would say outside of Brazil that has just an astronomically large bioeconomy, um, these are the largest industrial bioenergy sources on earth, these recovery boilers at large pulp mills. Now, it, anytime there's waste wood, it, particularly things like bark and uh, sawdust that can't really be used as you know substrate for making paper, um, sawmills, pulp mills, uh, even other places have biomass boilers that would just burn um, you know, sort of typically a lower grade uh, parts of the trees that can't be turned into other product products. There's some anaerobic digestion of, of waste products that goes on that produces a little bit of methane, a little bit of biogas. Um, so, so there's already a big potential uh, for this. There's also, you know, non-centralized production, firewood, wood pellets. These are, these are major global heating and, uh, and, and, and cooking uh, substrates too. There's not going to be any new pulp mills built in Canada anytime soon, given how you know the um, economies have changed and and how much less paper products we use and competition from uh, particularly South America, where trees grow very very fast. Um, but there is potential room to grow in these biomass boilers. I've shown shown some pictures of some older ones at existing pulp mills on the upper left. There was a brand new one in New Brunswick. I was touring in the early 2010s uh, here, a very efficient biomass boiler. Um, Kirkland Lake, a, a, a small city in northern Ontario, has a municipal scale biomass boiler that burns wood to produce uh, heat and electricity for the, the city. Confederation College here in, in Thunder Bay has a biomass boiler that burns uh, wood chips and, and heats the whole campus um, and produces a little bit of electricity too. Um, the largest thermal electricity generating plant in North America is in Atacokan in northwestern Ontario, not too far from Thunder Bay. It converted a coal plant to a, a wood pellet plant. And this is the largest thermal biomass powered uh, electricity plant in, in North America. So maybe there's some room to grow, but we have to be careful. The economics don't really work out such that you can go and harvest forest just for, at least in, at least in most parts of say boreal, uh, the boreal forest in Ontario, to go out and carry out forestry operations and replanting operations and hauling material. The economics aren't quite there yet to just do that to produce biomass for bioenergy. So oftentimes then enhanced bioenergy production has to be tied to already producing lumber, two by fours, or producing pulp and paper. And you wanna just take a little bit more. This is a picture of a clear cut and actually about 50% about of the biomass is left behind. If you consider the root structures of the trees, a lot of the, if a trees are delimbed right on site, topped on site, you get a lot of biomass that's left behind as organic matter on the site. You can go from that to what's called whole tree harvesting, where the, the, the skidder would pull the whole trees to a landing, delimb them there, and then grind up that low value, small, small pieces of, you know, tops of trees and branches of trees and, and produce extra biomass that could be sent to the boiler for energy production or go really extreme. And this was an experimental trial um, in, in uh, Northern Ontario that I was part of uh, where we wanted to do this. And then we also wanted to remove the below ground biomass. So we ripped up the stumps, we shook as much soil off, we ground them up and they went to a biomass boiler. Um, and this was looking at an extreme biomass removal. Um, this is done operationally though, in some parts of, of Scandinavia. Um, there was, you know, big alarm bells about this. Uh, Greenpeace in the early 2010s published a, um, a, a report saying that this is unsustainable, that this is a biomass, you know, the play on the word biomass. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I'm, you know, personally less skeptical of this, but it's not to say there's not serious issues that have to be, that have to be addressed. Um, and one way to think of this, of doing this is, you, you know, let's say this is the picture from our, our small scale trial where we did this intensified biomass harvest to enhance bioenergy production. We wanted to see what, how the regenerating ecosystem responds, you know, are there, is there lower biodiversity because we're removing all the nutrients in this biomass? Is there less nutrition for the next generation of trees? Um, one potential partial solution to this is that, you know, the, 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 the material gets ground up and turned into this fuel that's burned in a biomass boiler. You produce heat, you produce electricity. The main waste product is wood ash. And, and in that wood ash is all of the mineral, the non-volatilized 
nutrients that were taken up by plants from the soil, built into the, the trees, particularly concentrated in the bark. Most of this is landfilled. It's treated as industrial waste. waste. It ends up in a landfill. So we've also been really interested in whether we can return that biomass boiler ash back to the forest in a way that gives the next generation of trees those nutrients back. You're kind of closing a cycle rather than, you know, taking nutrients out in the tree biomass and putting it into a landfill. But there's big questions about how to deliver the right amount of nutrients at the right time. Um, th things like heavy metals can be in, in, um, concentrated in, in wood ash. You have to make sure that we're not uh, in, you know, introducing pollution uh, to these sites. Um, and there's been a lot of good research going on. So most university faculty members at, at Lakehead and other places, half of our job is running research programs. So, you know, we teach. So I teach, I teach four courses, well, six, because I co-teach two of them uh, a year. Uh, I'm a graduate coordinator, so I, I get to not teach one course because of that. But then the other half of my work time is spent running a research program. So that's working with uh, federal government agencies, with industries, with communities, getting funding to answer research questions. And then we hire students who do the work and while they're doing the work, they learn, there's education going, going on. Um, and oftentimes this ends up as graduate student theses, master's theses and PhD theses, undergraduate honors theses. Um, and, uh, and, and this research is all sort of tied into this. Um, and Jordan, should I take questions during this or wait till the end, do you think? You can certainly mix them in if you would like. Let me see. I'm sorry. I've been. Uh, uh, who had their hand up? Can you? Uh... If you open the, the Q&A, we have four already submitted um, from various students. None of them particular tie to the, the biomass. Um, Let so me you may uh... wish to save them until the Q&A period. All right, let me do that. I'll keep myself less distracted that way. And I'm almost done here. Um, so, you know, what we've been looking at, you know, managed forests, but also these more intensively, you know, biomass harvest trials, and also looking at how and what's the best way to restore wood ash um, back to forest soils in ways that's going to, you know, do good without doing harm. And um, my close colleague, Amanda uh, Dian Shaw, who's at Lakehead, and I've been involved in the on this network of wood ash addition sites that began really, you know, about 2012. So only about 10 years, uh, we were involved in the four Ontario trials here. Um, you know, there's big issues of when you remove more biomass from a forest, you're removing habitat for for organisms. These are ongoing considerations that we're still studying and many others are still studying and trying to get a handle on. Uh, we're starting to feel pretty good that the nutrient issues of returning wood ash back to forests uh, can be generally positive, causing little harm. Um, you know, how to do it operationally are still some big questions, but this has been going on. Um, this is a former student. I want to just highlight a couple students here uh, um, to remind all of you and, and, you know, at least many incoming undergrads might not might not might not you know know this yet, um, but that that students are really the crux the the crux of why we do research as 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 university faculty members. Of course, we want to answer applied questions, but more importantly than that, we want to educate students um, to go on and solve the next generation of problems. So Emily was a, a MSc forestry student with me. She's now a permanent researcher at Canadian Forest Service in Sault Ste. Marie. Her honors thesis work was looking at those intensive biomass harvest trials and what it was doing to the forest biological communities. In her new role at Canadian Forest Service, she's been looking across this wood ash uh, application. Um, and this is a paper Emily just published this year that showing that the, the microbes, but also the small invertebrates, the small kind of insect-like uh, organisms in soil, um, weren't showing many negative responses to wood ash, uh, which, was, which was very positive. She revis revisited some of her master's sites in at least over five years, which is still relatively short on a lifespan of a forest, even a managed forest, showed that the the biological communities were quite affected by any sort of clear cut harvesting, but the additional biomass removal wasn't causing additional changes. So we're, we're continuing to track that. Um, and Emily's now gone on to, you know, a very fruitful uh, career to, to do, you know, many better things than I, than I can do. Another student I want to highlight is uh, Stephanie Pugliese. So Stephanie was an undergraduate thesis student working with me. She worked the summer before her final, her fourth year, and then uh, and then stayed on for an honors thesis and then worked for me the summer before she went on to graduate school with a colleague of mine in environmental chemistry. Um, 
And Stephanie was one of the earlier students working on these questions about how and whether or not we can use wood ash as a forest soil amendment. So she did a lot of greenhouse work, and this was in collaboration with our provincial ministry of natural resources uh, colleagues. Stephanie actually got to spend a few months working in their greenhouses, um, and then um, published her honors. We published her honors thesis paper in Canadian Journal of Soil Science, and it was the first kind of test of a whole bunch of different wood ashes and a whole bunch of different soil types. And this gave us the data to get the permits to do these field trials. So it, it was, you know, a small scale undergraduate honors thesis, but it really was important. And it really was that first step. And again, Stephanie went on, she did her PhD in chemistry. She's now five years into her faculty position as a professor at York University. She's applying for tenure this year, um, which makes me feel like I'm aging quickly. But it's one of the most exciting things for me and for most Lakehead faculty members is to involve students in these research projects and then see them go on and, you know, perform better than I could ever perform myself. So um, with that, I'll uh, stop and say thank you. And here's my email address. And um, now I'll start to go through some of these questions. Awesome. Well, thank you again for that presentation. And thank you for sharing more about the, the research that Lakehead students are involved in and you know getting them excited for what they can anticipate when they arrive, whether it's this fall, whether it's uh, in an upcoming semester beyond. I'm sure you've intrigued many people. Um, research is an, often a, a major consideration for our students as they explore their options. Um, All right. Moving into the questions here, uh, the first question we had is from Katya. I'll pass over to you to read. Sure. So if you, uh, if you read that one, um, you're more great. welcome to have to And great, great question, uh, Katya. So, um, so it's uh, although it seems impossible that people could deny that humans have any responsibility for climate change, there are still those who say the Earth is just part of a natural cycle, like past ice ages. How do you respond to these perspectives? This is an excellent, excellent question. And, um, you know, the, I, well, I guess the fundamental reason that the Earth goes through natural climate cycles is because the relationship between the Earth and the Sun change over time. So these they're called the Milankovitch cycles, but Milankovitch was a scientist who first described how the, the shape of the Earth's orbit around the Sun changes cyclically. It goes from being a circle, almost a perfect circle, to being kind of a squash circle, an ellipse. Also, the tilt of the earth changes where it goes plus and minus 23 and a half degrees now between uh you know summer in northern hemisphere and summer in southern hemisphere but that changes over time whether or not the northern hemisphere which has more land mass is closer to the sun or farther away from the sun during the northern hemisphere summer also causes a cyclical change in how much energy is received by the earth and and we it, at least in a broad sense understand those really well and we know that we're in a warm period, but we also know we shouldn't be in a period of rapid warming, and we are. There's a few other key lines of evidence. I, I, with satellites going around in the stratosphere, the upper atmosphere, um, you know, so the warming's going on in the lower atmosphere, in the troposphere, um, but the stratosphere is getting colder. And now that we have satellites and, and sensors that can, at large scales, track the temperature of that upper atmosphere, it's getting colder. And it's getting colder because there's less heat that makes it back through the troposphere, the lower atmosphere, because of those greenhouse gases, that blanket that's keeping the lower atmosphere and the Earth's surface warm is you, the, you know, atmospheric scientists, this isn't me, but uh, atmospheric scientists can, can do these calculations and see that it's proportionally the right amount. The warming in the upper atmosphere ex, or in the lower atmosphere explains the cooling in the upper atmosphere. And the other main line of evidence is, is large scale climate models. So, so for since the 1970s, teams of scientists have been modeling the circulation of the atmosphere in the ocean, and the models are getting better and better as computing power and our understanding of, you know, fundamentals of atmospheric and ocean physics and the biological roles that the biosphere interacting, and uh, you know they are very very elegant models and there's many groups around the world that are almost competing with each other to make the best model. These models are really good for predicting what future climate's going to look like. But they can also explain why the current climate system functions like it does and why recent past climates look like they do. Um, and if those models don't include increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and to a less extent methane and nitrous oxide, they can't predict the current climate. So I think those, I'm not an, by no means am I an expert. I'm not an atmospheric scientist. I'm not an ocean scientist. But I think those are the, those are the main kind of lines of evidence. So um, next up to uh, Ghana administration, how do we get Oops, where'd we go? How do we get the public sector involved in climate change mitigation and adaptation um, uh, through just transition? And this is a 
Good, good question. To some extent, we've got the answers and we've had the answers, some would say since the 1890s when uh, you know scientists made estimates of they knew carbon dioxide could trap heat and they made estimates of how much coal was being burnt and said, we, you know, in a thousand years, the earth might become quite a bit warmer. They didn't know it was gonna happen in a hundred years. Um, we know a lot already. So it, I think it's, imp it's important to, you know, continue to do research to fine tune estimates. Uh, again, I justify, you know, and, and enjoy research a lot because it's so involved with the education of students in, in research. Um, but we, we probably, I think there's no question. We know enough to to deal with the problem, and then it's a matter of governments have to play a role, right? They they have to change. They have to give reasonable emissions reduction targets, and they have to stick to them so industries can adapt. They have to give them rigid targets, but with realistic timelines. And I think that's that's it. And then invest in you know engineering solutions too. There's another question about uh, about uh, clean clean transportation down below. I saw. Um, how does government, the next one, um, uh, does Canada's government have any policy supporting new energy vehicles? And how is this new energy industry in Canada? This is not my area, so I only get what I read in the news. And that one of my best friends is a, is a mechanical engineering professor who, who does focus on, um, on electric, electrifying vehicles. Um, I mean, my understanding is that there's a huge, there's been a huge investment from the province of Ontario and the government of Canada. A lot of it is trying to just keep up with the subsidies that the Biden government in the U.S. is giving. Um, and but I think it's, I think, I think that's there. Again, I'm not. Uh, there, there are electric vehicle experts at Lakehead that aren't me, um, and this is where a lot of the change has to happen too. The next question from Nikita. This is so critical and so important. Um, uh, the indigenous population and their cultures also need to be taken into consideration while planning public support and cooperation to mitigate uh, climate change and environmental litigation. How could one possible approach, uh, or you know, what was one possible approach to handle this issue? Um, you know, so much of Canada's um, kind of post-colonial uh, wealth has been on the backs of indigenous people. And that, there's, there's no issue, that there's no question that that continues today, that there is large scale um, systemic racism and inequity. And that it, it, it's so important. I mean, I think Canada is starting to make some progress in that way. I'm not the person to ask. I mean, you need to, you need to listen to Indigenous uh, people about this. Um, and there's even some concerns that, you know, um, there's environmental racism tied to green initiatives, right? So um, so that is absolutely the best comment and such an appropriate comment and one that I hope our students and our graduates know and that can go on and work in a different way than how Canada's resource sectors have worked for the past 150 years. Um, and that's listen to the people whose, whose land uh, we're on for the most part. I mean, I, I even, that's kind of a gaffe that I said, this is provincially owned land. A lot of this land is traditional territories of First Nations that was taken inequitably. And, and I was managed in ways that would not have been uh, supported by those people. So I don't have all the answers. I think, I hope I'm in a continuous stream of trying to learn how to do better at this. Um, and I know I've got a lot of work to do in that regard, but that is such a critical question. And thank you for that. Um, so where are we here? Could wood ash also be used instead of chemical fertilizers? Carla Ramirez, I think so and I hope so. And so much of the challenges, the operational challenges of getting this wood ash back to where it was harvested from. Our forest ops professor, Jamal Amishev is starting to look at this, um, but it is a, it's sometimes challenging. Um, so could you use that to replace, for example, mined limestone that's used in local agriculture? Maybe when we look at the energetics of burning fuels to get it back to the forest, maybe a better source is to use it in fertilizers that would be used in agriculture. And it's a great question, you know, something I think that needs to be looked at. Um, we have another question. Um, it's more of a response to a comment made. 
Um, it's from students that are currently in Ghana, where they have sort of said that they're encouraged that planting more trees to help the environment uh, is directly the opposite to what is practiced in Canada. And then Doreen posed the same question, say we factor replanting and afforestation mostly as the most, if not the only important carbon rest restoration method. Does the tree species being used play a role? So of course, Thunder Bay or, or Northwestern Ontario's uh, forest is very different than Ghana. So I don't know that you'll know the exact answer. No, but I know I we do a bit of international work with Ghana as well. Absolutely. The international, the fourth year international field school, uh, which is um, two weeks at the end of summer. So each first year, second year, third year, fourth year. Um, and actually the, the course based master students all do a field school. The fourth year undergraduate field school is going to Ghana this year. Um, I don't have those connections, but my close colleague, uh, uh, Matthew Leach, is, who's leading that trip, does. Um, and you're absolutely right. So um, Gifty and, and Doreen, I'm, so much of my perspective is on, you know, northern Canadian forests where the, they call it the fire return interval is actually pretty fast. You know, it might be 100 to 200 years that there's a stand replacing fire and that there's big insect outbreaks. And, and I imagine that is so different from the forests of, of Ghana and Western Africa. So you're totally right. And so my, you know, my little bit of cynicism, I, I don't want to see Canada think that planting 2 billion trees is a good enough solution to not reducing fossil fuel emissions and reliance on fossil fuel energy. That said, you are absolutely right. And my perspective is very, you know, narrow to what my perspective is. And that there's billion other reasons we should be planting trees in Canada, but just as a way to mitigate fossil fuel emissions, I would say not so much. And Canada per capita emits by some metrics, the most fossil fuel uh, carbon equivalents per person on earth. So we, we carry the brunt of that much more than uh, Ghana. Um, and so, so that, that's also the reason I don't want to see Canada go down this road. Not to say that Canada shouldn't plant 2 billion trees. Canada shouldn't plant 2 billion trees and, and claim, hey, now we can we can continue to, you know, to, to burn lots of fossil fuels into the long term. Hopefully, hopefully that's a good enough answer for that. Um, so, Ranti, uh, a few oh, more sorry. questions. Um, I just want to note the time here. Uh, if you want, you can answer as the, the final three here and then we'll have to wrap it up here shortly. Sure. So, um, oh, this anaerobic digestion question. I've worked with a pro with a project in Nigeria where biomass from forests are converted to biogas through anaerobic digestion um, and the spent slurry used in agricultural lands. Um, you're absolutely right. And this is not done very much at all in Canada. We're just starting to work with pulp mills that produce huge, huge amounts of organic waste. The bits of organic matter in the wastewater that can't be turned into pulp and paper end up um, they're a waste product and they're, they're burned sometimes at an energy loss because the material is so wet or they're put into a landfill. Getting at how to anaerobically digest Canadian organic waste from pulp mills is a huge potential. Producing that biogas, the methane and hydrogen that you can burn to produce energy. The anaerobically digested waste is, you're right, it's such a good soil amendment compared to the raw waste. Um, so we've got to learn from Nigeria. I think that's a, that's a really great point. Thank you. Um, if planting trees is not, so this is uh, from Abina, um, if planting trees is not an effective way of fighting climate change in Canada, can you then elaborate more on uh, the effective ways Canadians have adopted? Thank you. I, I mean, again, it's probably a, a, a minor contribution the, the, to, you know, carry out afforestation. But, um, you know, the big one is, uh, you know, energy conversion using, not energy conversion, converting energy systems from fossil fuel based to renewable. And that is a monumental task that really only the government can lead at this scale. Um, it has to be, you know, tightly aligned with industry so you don't put people out of work and you don't shut down industries that that transition is done well. And I don't have those answers, but I think that's, I think that's the main one. Reduction, right? We burn per capita, Canadians use so much energy. So, you know, we could maybe keep our lifestyles generally the same with a lot less energy use. And I'm guilty of this too. Um, so last question, oh, this is going to be a tricky one. Okay, so uh, what are the different ways in which Canadian government's working toward a tackle ex the excessive use of biofuel? I mean, I would say maybe in Canada, the opposite's true. We're a big oil producing country um, and, uh, and, and um, you know, using locally produced biofuel, we want to be conscious of, um, we want to be conscious of, for example, 
uh, biofuel stocks that are coming from, I mean, you know, palm oil plantations or places where the environmental impacts are, you know, borne by, by, by people that aren't in Canada um, and, and, and in, you know, particularly tropical countries. Um, but I think locally sourced bioenergy feedstocks could be, you know, could be part of Canada's climate change solution and could be good for the forestry sector, right? The forestry sector has faced big, big downturns in the last 20 years because of people are using less paper, a lot of global competition, um, particularly from, from South America. Um, and, uh, and that might be a way to sort of bolster Canada's forestry sector. So, all right, is that, we're out of time now, Jordan? Yes, I, I wanna take this opportunity to thank you for joining us and sharing more about climate change, the biosphere and, and Ontario's north, but also uh, giving our future students that opportunity to learn more about uh, what they can anticipate when they arrive here on campus, perhaps if they're in a program that you will help facilitate, or if they may uh, now be inspired to take one of the courses that you deliver as an elective, who knows? Uh, we'll just have to wait and see, I guess, this fall. But uh, before I let everyone go, I don't want to take this opportunity to remind you to follow us on social media. You can find us at Lakehead International on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you want to check out our campuses, explore Thunder Bay or Aurelia's facilities, residences, all that sort of stuff, you can head over to lakehead.ca forward slash tours. And last but not least, I know I mentioned we have a few more live events uh, coming up. And if you want to save your seat at those live events, you can scan the QR code at the bottom left of your screen or visit lakeadu.ca forward slash international dash live. Uh, one more final and friendly reminder to our admitted applicants who will be joining us this fall 2023. So that is those students who have applied and have an offer to a program here at Lakehead University. Now is the time to share your pride and celebrate with your incoming class of 2023 by taking a quick selfie in front of a special location to you. So we have some of our students here in India and Mexico showcased uh, at special locations in their home countries. Uh, they shared a quick story and a bit of information about themselves. They were entered in to win some great prizes. Our grand three prizes are on the screen here. Winter Fun Pack, Flight Voucher, and a $5,000 tuition credit being our grand prize. Um, all of those will be drawn live on Tuesday, May 30th at 12 p.m. noon Eastern time. If you would like to participate, you can head over to yourchoicematters.ca once again. You know how to sign up and save your seat at all of our upcoming live events at the bottom of your screen. On that note, though, thank you again to Dr. Basilico for joining us. It's been a pleasure uh, to host today's mock lecture, and, and it's great to learn more about uh, climate change and, and our role as uh, everyday citizens, essentially. So thank you for sharing more. Um, and to our audience, as always, thank you for the uh, participation and the polling and the questions you made today's session very engaging and great. So on that note, thanks again for joining us, and hopefully we will see you at the next event. Bye for now, folks. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, I want to encourage you to comment below or connect with us on social media. We can be found at Lakehead International on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thanks for watching once again, and hopefully we'll see you at the next live webinar. Bye for now.